This is going to be a very exciting episode. Episode 15 is all about the Edomites. I've broken it down into five parts. In part one, I will be discussing the ancient history of Edom, which parallels Israel's history. In part two, I will be discussing the Edomites' role in the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon in 586 BC. In part three, I will be discussing the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire's role in the Kingdom of Judea. In part four, I will be talking about prophecy in general, how it works, and how the Edomites fit into prophecy. In part five, we will have all of the information covered, and then we will discuss who are the Edomites today. In this part one, I will go over the ancient history of Edom. The history of Edom parallels the history of Israel and how Edomites were a vassal state to Israel and how they uh, joined up with a coalition of Israel's enemies and participated in the destruction and the slavery of Israel by Assyria. Now, Izu is also called Edom, the nation uh, that was founded by Izu was named Edom, which uh, is a name he received from his brother Jacob when he sold him the porridge. And so e the Edomites became a nation that lived around Mount Seir, which is directly south of the Dead Sea. And if you look at this map that I'm showing, you'll see the red area was basically the nation of Edom. So, so far we've studied Abraham in episode 10, and Isaac in episode 13, and Jacob in episode 14. And in the episode 14 and 13, we learned a lot about Izu, who was Jacob's twin brother. In episode 10, Abraham was given the dream of the smoking furnace and told that his people would go into slavery in Egypt for 400 years. In episode 14, Jacob had 12 sons. They end up in Egypt. 400 years, and then Moses leads them out of Egypt, as many people have heard the story where they parted, where God parted the Red Sea and Moses led the slaves, the Israelite slaves, out of Egypt. The 12 tribes of Israel, who are named after the 12 sons of Jacob, more or less. We will cover that in the next few videos. Now, they went into Egypt for 400 years, and then Moses leads them out of Egypt uh, with miracles, and he leads them to Mount Sinai, and, where they, and then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And then, when they were ready to go into the Promised Land, is where the history of Edom begins. Because God told Moses that the children of Israel will pass through the land of Edom, but you will not take anything and you will not fight them because they are your brothers and they were given that land by God. And you will not um, touch even a rock or a stick in their land because they are your brothers. So Moses was moving along the coast and going in towards the land of Edom. And he asked them in Numbers chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 2, you can read about this, where Moses asked the Edomites to allow Israel to pass through their land. And he promised that he would stay on the road, he would pay for any water that he used, and Edom refused to allow them to pass through. And they had to turn around and go all the way back 
around the mountains to take a different route, which was a, a very long way. It took many days. And because of this extra long way, Israel became discouraged and began to grumble because of it. And they grumbled against God and against Moses. And this was when the, the when God sent fiery serpents among the Israelites that would bite them. And they many of them died from the fiery serpents. And the the uh, the cure for the fiery serpents was that Moses would make uh, he made a copper serpent and put it up on a stick. And anyone that got bit by a fiery serpent would look at the copper serpent and be cured. And this was a, a, a symbolic of Jesus Christ because Jesus said in the Gospels that just as the fiery serpent was lifted up by Moses in the wilderness, so he also must be lifted up. And he, ta he was talking about his crucifixion. So this uh, fiery serpent story began with the Edomites refusing to allow them to pass through their land. Okay, now continuing with the story of the Israelites, in the book of Joshua, the Israelites conquested the land of Canaan. If we remember from episode 7, Noah cursed the Canaanites, the grandson, his own grandson, who was the son of Ham. And so this was the conquest of the land of Canaan by the Israelites. And then, for a period of time, Israel was ruled over by judges, and God was their king, considered their king, and judges ruled over them, and that is covered in the book of Judges. And then the Israelites asked for a king, just like the other nations, and God gave them a king named Saul. And Saul was a, a tyrannical king, and then God, the next king after Saul, God rose up David, who was the greatest king of Israel in ancient times. As we remember, David was the boy who slew the giant Goliath, and this got him the fame where he came into the king's court of King Saul. And he was prophesied by a prophet that he would be king and he was anointed as king by the prophet and everybody knew he was going to be a king so this made Saul very jealous and Saul King Saul went after him and tried to kill him to take him out and there was a long period of time where David and his mighty men or his companions who were soldiers uh, lived in hiding in the land while Saul pursued them. But David had many chances to kill Saul, but he wouldn't kill the king that was appointed by God. He waited patiently until God got Saul out of the way before he took the throne. This was one of the attributes of David that God loved very much. So it was during the time that Saul was pursuing David, there was an Edomite. This is recorded in the first book of Samuel, chapter 21 and 22. There was an Edomite named Duig, who was a servant of Saul. And Saul was pursuing David, and there was a city of priests named the city of Nob. So David visits that city, and that's where he was given the showbread, which is the showbread that was made by the priests that was supposed to be used specifically for the temple. It was like holy bread. And the, he, they were also were holding the sword of Goliath, who David had killed when he was a, a boy. So they gave him the sword of Goliath and the showbread for his men. And 
Duig was there when that happened, the Edomite. And Duig told Saul what the priests had done and what they had given David. So Saul commands his soldiers to slaughter the priests. And his soldiers refused because they were the priests of God. And Duig said, I'll do it. So Duig took charge and he slaughtered 85 priests and he slaughtered the whole city. And one person escaped and told David about it. And David said, I knew Duig would tell Saul. And he took it, he took it as his own fault that he allowed Duig to live. Now when David expanded his kingdom, he put garrisons all through Edom. So he uh, subjugated the nation of Edom. And he made them his servants. And he had his captain Joab slay every male in the kingdom. And I suppose that was in retribution for what Duig, the Edomite, had done. Then the next king after David, his son, was King Solomon. He lived about 970 to 930 BC. And Solomon had a partnership with Hiram, the king of Tyre, of the Phoenician king. And they made a navy of ships in the port at Izion Geber on the shore of the Red Sea in Edom. And from that port, they brought 420 talents of gold from Ophir to King Solomon. Uh, Ophir is a, 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 a place that, a legendary place where all this gold came from that has never really been found. It is thought to be somewhere along the Ivory Coast in Africa, probably. Uh, 420 talents of gold is equal to 13,860 kilograms or 31,500 pounds of gold that King Solomon took from that port city through Edom. Now, King Solomon was known for, for being, uh, for loving all kinds of different women, and he began the practice of marrying the daughters of kings of the kingdoms around him as alliances. And this was forbidden by God because they were all idol worshippers and they all had different religions. And he said, if you marry their women, then their women will entice you to worship their gods. And Solomon loved many strange women with the, the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, the Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said to the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave to these in love. This was Solomon's downfall. So God raised up an adversary to Solomon. When Joab, the captain of David's army, had slain every male in Edom, Hadad the, Ed Hadad, the Edomite, and a band of his servants had fled to Egypt. He lived in a Pharaoh's house and married Pharaoh's sister. When he heard that David and Joab were both dead, he moved back and became an adversary to Solomon. And God was very angry with Solomon. In Solomon's day, Israel was divided by God into two kingdoms. And ten tribes became the northern kingdom named Israel. And two tribes became the southern kingdom, which was named Judah. And God used Israel to chastise Judah. And he kept Judah for David's sake. 
because he had promised David that his son would sit on the throne of Israel forever. But Solomon had made God angry. So Solomon was still given a kingdom by God. A little, well, a century later, 875 to 850 was the time when Ahab and Jezebel ruled over the northern kingdom of Israel. Many people have heard of Jezebel. She was the daughter of the Phoenician king of Tyre, and she was a Baal worshiper. Baal worship is basically a pantheon of gods. There's the chief god, and then there's all the lesser gods below them, and it's basically idolatry. And she enticed Ahab to bring the national conversion into Israel to, bear, to Baal worship. She was the one who was confronted by Elijah the prophet. Jehoshaphat, during the same time, was the king of Judah. His father Asa had purged Judah of all the foreign gods and idolatry that Judah had adopted. So Judah was now purged and cleaned from idolatry, and Jehoshaphat inherited the kingdom. Well, Jehoshaphat made ships of ships to go to Ophir for gold, like Solomon had done, but the ships were broken in Ezion Geber, and at that time there was no kingdom king in Edom, only appointed governors. So Edom was a vassal state to Judah. In 2 Kings chapter 3, Jehoram, the king of Israel, who was the son of Ahab, he asked Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, to join him in battle against Moab, who had rebelled. So Moab was the kingdom that was a vassal state to Israel, while Edom was a vassal state to Judah. So Jehoshaphat agreed to help him because he said, we are one people. And they went through, now if we remember, Jehoshaphat is got the temple in Jerusalem, in Judah, and they are serving God, which is the one God, no idols. Northern kingdom of Israel was under Jehoram, who was the son of Ahab and Jezebel, and they had Baal worship. So they agreed to help him to go and bring Moab back under subjection. And they decided to attack Moab from Edom. So they went into the kingdom of Edom and went to attack Moab from the south. And there was no water for the army. Jehoram, who was the king of Israel, the Baal worshiper, he said, Jehovah has gathered these three kings, Judah, Israel, and Edom, to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So he's, he's like, he thought, Jehovah's always against us. And Jehoshaphat said, there is a prophet we can ask. His name is Elisha, and he was the, um, the uh, apprentice prophet, you could say, to Elijah. And so the three kings went to him. And Elisha says to Jehoram, what do I have to do with you? Go to the prophets of your mother and father, Ahab and Jezebel. And Jehoram says, no, but Jehovah has called these three, three kings together to deliver them into the hands of Moab. So Jehoram saying, well, it's your God that is setting us up. So we came to you. And Elisha says, if it were, if it were not for Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not even look at you. Elisha called a minstrel to play. So he didn't say any prophecy out of his own mouth. He called a singer to sing a song. The singer sang, Make this valley full of ditches. You shall not see wind or rain, but this valley shall be filled with water. 
and he shall deliver the Moabites into your hand, and you shall slay every city, fall every tree, stop up every well, and cast stones on every good piece of land. So God said, uh, dig ditches. There won't be any rain, there won't be any wind, but the ditches will be full of water in the morning, and you will win over Moab, but you will dis destroy every city, destroy every good piece of ground, and stop up every well, and fall every tree. So, because they were idol worshippers, they were the vassal kingdom to Israel. So it's like, you will win against Moab, but Israel is not going to gain a thing from it. And in the morning, the country was filled with water from Edom. And I watched a video on YouTube about that. And Mount Seir is uh, it's a very, it's a rock mountain and the rock's very smooth. And what the archaeologists found was that they had made these trenches along the rock all over this mountain and all the trenches all led to larger trenches and larger trenches until they went into these caves and what would happen was at night when there was a the dew would collect on the mountain and as a frost and in the morning they would the the water would run down the mountain through these trenches and fill these caves with water and that was their water supply so that was likely the um, natural occurrence that filled these ditches with water so oftentimes god will use natural occurrences uh, he he won't always just do a miracle he will tell them to do something which is actually a very scientific thing and that might be what happened and sometimes well God will do an out and out miracle so in the morning the ditches were filled with water and the armies all drank the water and their horses or their whatever animals they had and the Moabite army had gathered on the border and they saw the water on the ditches and the reflection of the water and it looked red and they thought it was blood and they thought the three kings Edom, Judah and Israel had turned on each other because they know Israel were idol worshippers and they knew that Judah was against idol worship and they knew that Edom was a, a puppet kingdom to Judah so they figured these three kings had all turned on each other, and that's why there was all the blood. So the Moabite army went running over to them because they were going to go take all the spoils of all their goods. And so the, there was nothing wrong with them. They were sitting there getting ready to go to battle, and the, Mo, no, the Moabite army just walked right in, right into their trap, into their camp. And they were slaughtered. And so then they slaughtered the Moabites and they pursued them into Moab. And they slew every city. They felled every tree. They stopped up every well. And they ruined every good bit piece of land with stones. And the king of Moab took 700 men to break through to the king of Edom. But they couldn't. He then took his eldest son and offered him up on the wall as an offering. There was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and went home. So the king of Moab, when he saw he, could, he was losing, he offered his son, probably a young boy, up on the wall as an offering to the gods. And these were the same gods uh, as Israel worshipped. So Edom and Judah had great indignation towards Israel. Like this, this freaked them out. And they just said, we're done here. Because they'd already ruined the land. And they've already filled, fulfilled God's command. So they just left. And then Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat. Now you notice Jehoshaphat named his son Jehoram 
after his buddy, the king of Israel, who was Ahab and Jezebel's son. So they started naming their children after each other as a uh, alliance. So Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, married the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And he ruled for eight years, and he walked after the ways of Israel, which was Baal worship. He brought Baal worship into Judah. And the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake. In his days Edom revolted from Judah and made a king for themselves. Jehoram went and camped near them with his army, and they surrounded him by night, and he killed many, but the revolt never ended. So he lost the, the puppet kingdom of Edom because of his idolatry. Now the next event regarding Edom is found in 2 Kings chapter 14 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 25. Because you'll find the um, there's a first and second book of Kings, and there's a first and second book of Chronicles. Now the book of Kings is the history recorded by the kingdom of Judah, while the book of Chronicles is the history recorded by the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom. And you'll find that their two histories are intertwined. So as you read the Kings and the Chronicles, you see that they both talk a lot about the same events, but from a different from a different perspective sometimes, or they'll have information that they can be added together to for more information. So anyway, King Amaziah of Judah lived about seven ninety to seven sixty BC. He went into Edom. And he killed, now remember Edom had set up a king for themselves years before under Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat. So King Amaziah went into Edom and he killed 10,000. He also took 10,000 prisoners and he threw them off a cliff. And then he took the gods of the Edomites and set them up in Jerusalem to be his own gods. And he worshipped them. And God sent a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of your hand? And the king said to him, Are you made of the king's council? Why shouldn't you be smitten? And the prophet forbear. Well, the prophet stopped talking, but he said, I know God has determined to destroy, to destroy you because you have done this and has not hearkened unto my counsel. And eventually Amaziah was killed by a conspiracy of his own princes. And the next event to happen can be found in 2 Kings chapter 16 and 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 28. And also in the early chapters of the beginning of the book of Isaiah, it's also recorded. I think in chapter maybe 6. And this is about 730 B.C. to 715 B.C. King Ahaz of Judah. Um, now the king of Assyria, the Assyrian Empire... Uh, had now begun and this is the first of the great empires and the king of the Assyrian Empire at this time was named Tiglath-Pileser III. Now Tiglath-Pileser III was amassing his forces. He was getting ready to come against the northern kingdom of Israel. King Ahaz of Judah sent to the king of Assyria for help because the Edomites had come and taken many captives from Judah, and the Philistines had also come and taken territory, because they still had the Edomite gods, and they, they were still 
not following God's ways. And every time that happened, their neighbors would start attacking them and winning over them. So he sent to the king of Assyria for help against the Edomites. Ahaz was counseled by the prophet Isaiah to trust in God and not to worry. But he trusted in the king of Assyria instead. And he made allies with the king of Assyria. So Assyria, he came and he took the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity. The lost ten tribes were the northern kingdom. And this is where, when they became the lost ten tribes of Israel. Um, they were never seen again. They're gone into captivity. They were taken as slaves. And there's a lot of people studying things and speculating about who they are and where they are. They're lost. That's another study. That's a whole different study. And I don't know if we'll even do that study. You'll find out why in the next episode. But anyway, so he took the lost ten tribes of Israel, the entire nation of the northern kingdom of Israel, into slavery. And he brought another people from another place. Assyria was famous for this. This was one of their war tactics, was displacing people. Whenever they conquered a kingdom, they would take them as slaves and they would put them somewhere else, and then they would take people from somewhere else and put them in their land. And that way the people were never in their own land, and this weakened them a lot, and he was over, able to rule over them this way. And he also used them as slaves in his army. The slaves would be at the front of the army, and they would be slaughtered first while his real soldiers were behind them. And... So Israel was taken into slavery and gone. Um, and then Judah became a puppet state. And Judah had to adapt the Assyrian gods. And Ahaz went to Damascus to swear allegiance to Tiglath Pilaser III. So Tiglath Pilaser had set up his camp in Damascus. And when Ahab was there, he saw an altar there that he really liked a lot. It was an altar to some other god. And he had a replica made of it, and he put it in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was never overthrown by the Assyrian Empire, but the entire nation of Judah was taken, was um, under subjection. And Jerusalem was surrounded, but it was never overthrown by Assyria. And there is a story in the Bible of um, the Assyrian army was camped outside Jerusalem, and God sent an angel who slew 185,000 of the Assyrian army. And from that time on, they just moved out and didn't bother Jerusalem again. So, so far, that's basically the history of Edom on how it parallels with Israel and Judah. This concludes part one of our series. In part two, we will carry on with our history, beginning with the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon in 586 B.C.